our uh, program. We did this uh, last year and went very well, and I had Josh and I had some uh, really good feedback on that, and that is our uh, farmer panel. So uh, I asked my farmers um, to come up. I got uh, Buck Mars from Queen Anne's County. Uh, Kyle Hutchison is here from Talbot County. Aaron Thompson from Kent County, Delaware. And Howard Anderson is here from um, Calvert County. Josh, I'll turn it over to you, and you can introduce our moderator. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, I guess, going to be our wrap-up. And, and like Jenny said, last year it went really well. So this is a time to have conversations. Any of those questions that you, you've had with farmers that are using some level of precision uh, equipment in their operation. And I think, you know, we kind of put them up front here. But the real idea is for everybody in the audience to have a conversation at whatever level you're at and to get some interaction, exchange ideas with your peers from people that are actually using it and not the, you know, eggheads from the university that don't know how to actually do real field work and stuff, you know. So these, these guys have, you know, been through the same challenges as the folks in the audience. Now, the other thing we've had this year is my good buddy, Dr. Mike Bushermall from the University of Tennessee. You all probably recognize him. This is his third year coming out. Uh, so he's a ton of fun, and, and we've had him back every year. Uh, he's got a lot of knowledge in precision ag. He's an ag engineer from University of Tennessee, and we thought, let's get someone outside to moderate this panel. So he doesn't have a dog in the race, so to speak, and uh, his job is to keep the conversation going. So I'll turn it over to Mike to kind of get things fired up. Obviously, Josh has heard me speak before because I generally don't stop. Uh, I think producer panels, and back in Tennessee, we've gone to trying to use producer panels more and more because we in Extension get up and we talk about technologies, and oftentimes we make it sound so simple, uh, easy to use, easy to learn, and there are challenges. And so the, I think the producer panel is a great opportunity to learn from folks that have learned the hard way. And so I want to start off by letting each one of, of our panel participants kind of give a little overview uh, of their farming operation and, and some of the technologies that they use. And so, Buck, I believe I will start with you on the end and let's work our way down. Uh, Is it on, Jay? You're live. Um, I've, I've used uh, yield monitors for years and years and years. Probably when they first came out, made my own maps and uh, and we use the uh, row cutoffs, the direct command for sprayers. Uh, started with uh, variable rate uh, seeding populations by three, four years ago. And that's when I realized that I didn't have good enough yield maps because it takes a lot of data to put together a prescription map that's worth anything. So. My name is Aaron Thompson. I farm with my brother and my father in Hartley, Delaware. <clears throat> we till about 1,100 acres, uh, raise poultry for, uh, for Purdue, raise some dairy heifers and run a farm shop. Um, I kind of figured the size that we are, it makes it hard just to go out and buy a lot of brand new tractors with um, technology in it. So I've been trying to put some of it on our older equipment ourselves. We're using auto swath, some, some auto steer, but not with the auto uh, RTK. Um, so those are the two main things we're using right now. Haven't got into the clutches, but we'll be adding on to our systems in the near future. I'm Kyle Hutchison, part of a uh, family partnership. Um, we farm um, corn, wheat, soybeans, barley, and uh, vegetables, peas. Uh, baby llama beans and cucumbers. I just finished planting cucumbers about two hours ago. Yeah. It's pretty late this year. Um, we're not at the RTK level yet. We've decided not quite to go there. Um, we use WAS and a lot of other things on the sprayer and combine and planting tractors. Um, we struggle with um, a little bit that we're mostly green, but we started with Ag Leaders uh, equipment and we're familiar with that, but I guess one of our issues is the compatibility of the different types of um, precision software and trying to figure out which road to go down. So, because once you start down the road, you're not really going to switch over to the other one. So maybe other people have that issue too. Um, and then we also use 
I don't know if it's precision or not, but we use uh, remote monitoring and control on center pivot irrigations also. We have about 10 pivots that are about 15 miles away from home and we use uh, remote monitoring and control on them, which is very helpful at two o'clock in the morning. So you don't have to drive over there, you can just get on the laptop. Uh, we operate much differently as a an estate, and the farm is a part of the estate. When we first started out, we had the farm, but then as we moved along, to maintain efficiency, we accumulated some other parts of the estate, like other houses, which supports the farm, and plus we have our own income having worked full time before our retirement when we still had the farm. Now we have the, we have the farm and we have several houses, which brings all the money in through this apartment, partner, uh, partnership and it is working very, very well in that our children are part of the planning as to what we're going to do at, with, uh, in the farming operation as well as the managing of the properties. So we're very heavily dependent upon the computer and the work we do with companies like Complete Computer Pro um, uh, uh, was Clyde's operation. <laughs> and uh, even though our children are not in this area, we bring them in to the farm, try to do it once a year. And they come in and they work as part of the farm. And it's been very, uh, it is helping to keep the family together. Okay, here's how I thought I, I would do this. It's very important and to make this successful that we get questions from the crowd. So I'm gonna start off and I've got a list of questions to hopefully keep it going, but I'm gonna ask the first question and then when I get done, I hope that kind of gets you out in the crowd, you know, what if, or, or you have a question or you've been working in the technology or you're wanting to know what technology may be where I should start I'm hoping that questions come from the crowd instead of from an extension specialist out of about 458 miles from home. So, which, you know, I come to Maryland once a year whether I need to or not. So I'm gonna ask the first question and I've sat here and listened to numerous technologies that all of you all have adopted, some more than others. And so the first question I have is, what technology do you think has helped most in your farming operation? And I know it's a difficult question. So I'm gonna start off again back on the end, Buck, if you don't mind. And what technology do you think has helped you the most in your farming operation? I'd, I'd have to say the yield monitor is the most important because if you go to make prescription maps, the first year we used the uh, soil type and I didn't agree with when I was planning the prescription uh, planning, it seemed like sometimes I was in the wrong spot in the field that I knew the yields were, should be better there and it was telling me to cut back on population. So I, I would say a yield map and you better keep good good yield map uh, records in order to use them. Uh, that, that's the most important thing. Buck, how many years worth of yield data do you have now? Well, I'm supposed to have about 15, but I think <laughs> I got about two or three years of good data. Of good data, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that is an issue, and Joe talked about this, this morning, uh, trying to take a yield map. And trust me, I spend a lot of time sitting in a lazy boy chair watching NASCAR or football making maps. Uh, and I can take and give make you 300 maps out of the same data. <clears throat> and so which one is correct? And so, and Joe mentioned this morning, the inaccuracies. And so you've got to filter, and, and I can't stress that enough. You can't use raw yield data uh, to be able to make a prescription map because now we're looking at trying to do site-specific management of, of, of the number of seeds per acre or fertilizer or chemical application and so it's very critical. 
Aaron, what do you think about your operation? I would have to agree the yield monitor is probably the number one. Um, it, it opens up a whole lot of doors for you to try. Um, we're trying some strip tilling, so for a fact we can take some of the nitrogen. We're banding nitrogen underneath the row, so there's places where I can lay strips where I've actually knifed in the nitrogen instead of using a uh, strip till. So um, you're able to gather that data to try to make um, some information, gather some information to make decisions for next year on, on decisions on how to equip your other implements for the following year. We're also taking our yield data and instead of doing um, um, grid mapping, we're doing zone uh, soil sampling. So we're trying to target those areas that aren't as productive and find out why and address those areas. Not to beat a dead horse, but I think the, the yield map, yield monitor, um, we've been doing it for about 15 years too, is definitely the, the number one thing. Um, we have a, the guy that runs our planner likes to uh, do a lot of experiments and I, I like to look at them. So, but we'll try irrigated populations from 30 to 40,000 and then on each hybrid and figure out where we need to be on each hybrid and it's kind of neat to look at those things after the fact. Um, I guess I'm a little biased. I run the sprayer. I would not want to run another sprayer without auto steer and auto boom again in my life. So. <clears throat> I think the uh, maintain, maintenance of the equipment is our main technology. Uh, I just think that the faster you can get that, the equipment out working again, so the better, more money you spend on the operation of get, keeping the equipment working, the better off you are. Do we have a question from the crowd? Let me repeat the question for everybody. The question was about what we call site-specific soil sampling, whether it be grid or whether it be zone, and how they're incorporating that uh, in, into their nutrient management plans and their application of fertilizer here uh, in, in Maryland. Uh, uh, we tried grid sampling about uh, 10 years ago, maybe a little more. Uh, seemed to be too complicated. Price of fertilizer was cheaper then. Uh, we had to make two trips, put the potash, one to put the potash, one to put the phosphorus and uh, the other nutrients. So we went away, I went away from it, but I'm going back to the soil type sampling those areas and trying to uh, uh, do more variable rate fertilizer and seed population. Uh, we kind of started it mainly I was wanting to target was pH to see if how, how much the pH varied in the soil to whether that was causing um, the yield drag and for releasing of nutrients. Um, and I also wanted to just try to gain those spots over time to try to maybe make a better prediction on um, using prescription mapping which we haven't gotten into yet. But that was my main reason of starting that. Yeah. <clears throat> We are solely dependent upon a soil, our consultant for taking the soil samples and making our recommendations. The big issue that we see in our state with, with site-specific sampling is, and these guys have kind of pointed it out, that if you're going to go to zone management, which a lot of folks are trying to go to, it takes data to make a zone. Uh, grid sampling is, is our folks that are, have adopted it have little yield data or or any type of spatial you know data that they can use to create that and hopefully over time they'll be able to accumulate data to be able to make a, a zone that's stable uh, you know we've tried using a lot of different areas and a lot of different data types uh, and it uh, what data is is if good data makes a good map bad data makes a bad map any other questions? I got several others. The question is from a safety standpoint, uh, how does using precision ag technologies help them on the farm to basically keep their employees safe? The what? Or their wife. <laughs> or their wife. <laughs> the, well, only, the only comment I guess I could probably say is um, we have auto steer just using WAS and um, 
if we're like we pretty much use a lot of liquid fertilizer but we spread some dry potash I got a fellow this year that's just out of high school and um, he's never really spread fertilizer but I could set the auto steer up for him he understood how to set it up go to farm to farm and then his swaths or his paths are perfectly even so when you're done spreading you know it's spread right and not well you know if you're out off was it because he drove too close or too wide and then you're trying to guess again on whether you have the spreader set correctly so that's a big help for setting is you know that what you're driving is correct so we have scales on the farm we calibrate the spreader so once I know it's right then I can turn him loose and he can go from a chemical standpoint some of the folks that I work with uh, they're putting whatever chemicals that they're putting on the ground in their monitor and so then that map immediately goes back. A lot of our folks now are looking at doing, you know, automatic transfer over the wire. The data's coming into the monitor and being beamed to the cloud. And so we, we know what's been sprayed. Some of the things that we spray on cotton, we really don't need to be back in the field for another five or six days. And, and so that's given us the ability to take and, and know exactly what's going down on the field at any one time throughout the growing season. Any other questions? Keep thinking. Yes. Y'all want me to answer that real quick? Data management. <laughs> the, here's the, the question is, is if people are collecting data, and some folks have a lot of years worth of data, just like our panel up here, and, and there are impediments, uh, and, and what he's asked is what are those impediments? And I can tell you from, from experience, and these guys will too, is being able to manage the data. Joe, Joe talked about that this morning. What, I guess my question is, what software do you all use or do you farm it out to a third party vendor? And we see both in our state. Yeah. I, I have the ability to map my own yield maps and then I use them to overlay one another and just compare them. What, what software, Buck? Uh, you, map shots. You're using map shots. Yeah, and, uh, but I rely on my fertilizer dealer, Willard's. Uh, I'll put a plug in for them because they've been great to me for uh, making prescription maps and uh, doing some scouting and things of that nature uh, that, I, that I'm not capable of doing. Uh, the prescription maps are a little complicated and it's a whole lot easier just to take your three years of data or whatever you got that's good to them and let them take it from that point and just tell them what populations you want. We, we've gone from like 20, we were 29,000 to 31 dry land. And after a couple of years, we decided we're gonna move up to 28 to 32 range. We need a wider range, we decided. So, uh, I partner with a good uh, fertilizer dealer is, is uh, positive. We also use uh, Willards to help us with our maps, um, something that's, this uh, technology, as everyone knows, is so complicated. You have to have someone help you get started and then grow from there. Um, the one thing that they do is, of course, uh, they can give you your own, build your own community data off your own farm. So you're able to kind of compare your history in a summary based on what you've done in the past. Um, we also use Willards. Um, for us, the biggest issue is analyzing the data. We have people that can do it, but it's just time. And so we utilize a third party to help us because it's, it's just time. I guess I should point out that what we have is a cow-calf operation. So we're producing the hay and um, the grass that they, or the alfalfa which the animals consume. And I don't know if we have such a big problem with trying to uh, maintain our records on the um, soil analysis over the years, although we do maintain them in our computer so we can go back and see what the fields tested over the years, and so can our consultant. But I think with a cow-calf operation and with some of the feeds they have now, it seems that if the, our field is running low in a nutrient, 
with some of these feeds that the cow that you put out for the feeds and the cow licks them, the cow's weight seemed to be going, we're getting good gain and weight and good calving out of our animals. So. I'm gonna ask a question of the crowd. We're talking about data management. How many of you all actually use some type of software, you know, in your office to do data manipulation or data management? Raise your hand. How many of you all do and go to a third party vendor to get that service? A few of each. How many of you all don't have any data whatsoever? Raise your hand. How many people are lying to me because you didn't raise your hand? We're family, I've been here three years, so this is a family reunion. Uh, it, it is kind of interesting working with producers, and, and I do a lot of work with our county agents and, and spend a lot of time in West Tennessee where most of our big row crop operations are. And, and I work generally with folks anywhere from three to 30,000 acres. And I see a conglomerate of, of different approaches. I see folks that are dedicated to using software, whether it be Apex or SMS or MapShots or or farm works or, or whatever software package they're comfortable with. And they spend, and I think these guys just hit the nail on the head, you can spend a lot of time sitting in front of a computer analyzing data. And then there's the other party out there that are now decided they don't have the time to spend analyzing the data and so it's going to a third party vendor. Uh, and then there's still a lot that have a yield monitor that never download a card. Uh, they, you know, it makes a pretty map and you know, I'm, I'm in three bale cotton or I'm in 275 bushel corn and, and that's the extent. And, and when I ask, well, can you take me back to that place in the field that gave you three bale cotton last year or 275, they can't take me back because they don't have the map to be able to go back. And so collecting the data, sometimes I, I tell producers, if you don't know what to do with it now, in the future, we're probably gonna get far better at being able to analyze that data and be able to ma start making management decisions. You know, we all know crop prices are coming down, right? We probably know that fertilizer prices are going up. Seed never comes down. So our input costs will probably continue to rise and what we'll see with our crop prices, hopefully not go tanking any further than they already have. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, is do they think it would give one or two uh, potential uses uh, of UAVs, UASs. I don't like to call them drones. I'll tell a quick story. Uh, our House Ag Committee asked me uh, back in March to come make a presentation on the potential applications of using UAVs and throughout the whole House Chamber and throughout the whole State Capitol, they kept using the word drones and drones and drones. Little did I know they were waiting for me at the main entrance with a bomb sniffing German Shepherd. And my problem is, is I went through the wrong door. So I was there 45 minutes before they realized I was there and we had two UAVs to just kind of show and tell. The House Ag Committee wanted us to fly in the chamber and I told them that's probably not a smart move. <laughs> and so we had two demonstrations. We had a little bitty old quadcopter and, and the shell. We didn't even have the wings on it. And, and when the head of the state highway patrol, who's head of security over the Capitol came down, he was very professional, but you could tell he was a mic chapped that I had been there for 45 minutes. And they sicked that bomb sniffing dog and when they gave him the command, I thought I was going to jail. <laughs> so I don't use the word drones. So the question is, uh, do you, what applications do you think are out there for unmanned aerial vehicles or systems, which I typically call them? Uh, about everything that uh, fellow showed the slides earlier, <laughs> population, uh, uh, if you've got the yellow spot of nitrogen deficiency in the field, uh, uh, checking hybrids. Uh, I mean, he had a list up there about 10 things. Uh, the one guy said he can't find the insects yet, but I'm sure that's uh, going to be solved, and that would be a great uh, use. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it's just unlimited, I think, when we get done. I would have to agree with what he said. The one thing that I caught my attention from the earlier speaker before lunch was just talking about the uh, thin spots in the fields. We till some pretty tough ground, and if you could just do a quick flyover on your stand, um, it, sometimes you know you think your stand looks pretty good if you drive by it, but when you pull up the driveway or start walking, it's not always so good. 
um, I would think that would be a benefit that I would think that could get you a quick um, overview when you're especially busy still planting other crops to whether you need to go back in there when a crop was small to replant some small areas that may have not come up or drowned it out. Can I answer that question too? Uh, it's kind of interesting because we had our major field day two weeks ago in Milan, Tennessee, and, and we had a, I had a stop on, on UAVs and the potential applications, and somebody gave me some video, and, and it was, you know, I think directed crop scouting is going to be where we first probably go into using UAVs, and, and the video was, was really telling. It had two videos. One went over a cotton field. Cotton was probably about eight inches tall, maybe six to eight inches tall. And, and here lately, we've been having during our planting season, tremendous amount of rainfall coming in early in the season. And I'm not talking about a steady rain, I'm talking about two, three, four, six, eight inches of rain. And, and the video was, was really crisp and, and seeing the areas in that field that had drainage issues. Uh, and you could see where areas were standing water. And also uh, one of my big pushes for our bigger growers the last few years is being used in automatic section control. And I heard that on our planters. Uh, and this video was really telling because at the start of the field, it was flying over and you could see where they were missing the mark of whether lowering or raising the planter by up to five rows. And our rows for cotton are 38 inches. So it was quite telling, you know, that we, some of our fields and producers need to be running section control. The other was a neat field. It, it was a corn field and it was already too late to do anything about it. It was already tasseled, but you saw tremendous streaks throughout the field. There was a dark green streak and right next to it was a kind of a yellowish green streak. And, and this field had been given an applic in season application of nitrogen. And so there was an application error, whether nozzles were stu stuck, you know, clogged up or, or whether pumps weren't working. And, and the first thing that I thought of, if I could have caught that early in the growing season, could I have done something to rectify that problem? Because I know right now my yield's probably gonna suffer in those areas that, it, that really looked like they were nitrogen deficient. So I think it gives us an idea of maybe some directed scouting. Questions? Yes, sir. Okay, the question is this, I'll put it real simple to y'all. In Tennessee, I gotta keep things simple. Does this stuff pay for itself? Is that what you're asking? That's all I, I figured that's what you're, uh, <clears throat> does it pay for itself? On the sprayer, I can speak for that. The section control and the um, auto steering, uh, I did an analysis, I used to be 10% over, typically, and I'm down to three to five now. So that in that case it does. Um, I'm a former banker so I think about economics a lot, but I think some some things don't. But I mean that's that's an example, one thing that does. Um, uh, I just said we grow cucumbers, we only grow a couple hundred acres a year and we thought about putting RTK on all that, but for 200 acres if you grow so thousand dollars an acre is two hundred thousand dollars you can't spend twenty thousand dollars on three tractors to uh, put on auto steer so i mean you can't spend sixty thousand dollars for a two hundred thousand dollar crop that's just one example we also have the auto swaths as well on the sprayer i want to put the auto steer on but i was getting late getting it going um, by the time we were top dressing wheat um, so Yes, that definitely has paying us back. We're not getting near the overlap. I'm pretty much spraying really close to what's in the field. So I feel when we get some uh, clutches on our planters and we're gonna see the same, same result. And I would agree with him that clutches on the planters will pay back uh, fairly quick. I don't have a number, but I don't think you need to be a rocket science when you go out there and you see you don't have any overplanted corn in the turn row that you're saving money with the cost of seed corn at $250, $300 a bag. So that, that's a definite savings. It'll pay for itself. I don't know how long it'll take you, but it will pay for itself. I think, what was that question again? Does this stuff pay for itself? Well, <laughs> I think that my question, I would answer that last question much differently and easily. We're very, very happy with the 
the the money that we're getting and the money that's going out. Put the out. microphone closer. Put the microphone up. I think we're uh, balancing our income and expenditures very well in our operation. I, I'll get to you in a minute, Joe. I, I think Joe Luck made a, a great comment in his talk this morning, talked about data and doing on-farm research. I think it, that's the next step for us because a lot of producers, and, and I've worked with them, and, and Joe had some great slides of what people have tried, uh, and, and the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, until we start getting more in tune on on-farm research and doing it right, the question is, 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 did it make you money? You know, my philosophy in, in working with our growers is I really don't care if I save you money. I can save you a lot of money. Don't buy seed, don't buy fertilizer, don't buy equipment, don't rent land, don't farm. But when you start looking at did it make you money, and the only way that you can really do it is these guys have talked about varying the rate of seed or, or fertilizer until you put those unfarmed trials in there and validate that management decision. Did it make you money or did it not make you money? Then you really don't know. All you can say is I saved money by changing population, but if you don't come in and put you know, one or two or three reps and, and, and do it statistically correct, then you really don't know whether you've made money or not. And I think these guys have already told you the, the section control on sprayers and planters we've seen in our state, yes. Uh, the question about RTK and auto steer, a lot of our guys say, I don't know if it's making me any money, but I'll never buy another piece of equipment that doesn't have it on it. Because at the end of the day, they're not near as tired. They can work along. You know, it was kind of interesting. There was a survey done, and, and the producer said, oh, well, it gives me, the, the men, excuse me. The men said, it gives me a longer day. I can work longer days, and I'm not near as tired. When they surveyed their spouse, they basically said, I never see my husband. And so it just <laughs> depends on a different perspective. But we're seeing a lot of folks going to RTK because of the fatigue factor. And, and, and I guess you all are in the same boat as we are. The last few years, our planning window has shrunk and shrunk where we've got to get a lot of seed in the ground in a very short period of time. So it's hard to put a dollar value on some of these uh, technologies. Yes, Josh. He, Josh basically asked, have you ever done a profit map is what we call it. Take, take your inputs and take your yield, subtract off the input costs from the cost you got for the yield and make a profit map. It goes back to data management. That's the, that's the whole key. Yeah, I make them all the time because I have a, a different software and I can go in. I run, I run SMS and Apex just so I can get the data out into something that, that I can use more on a research base. And, and I've used FarmWorks too. They're all good software packages, but all software packages have a learning curve. Yes, sir. So if you had to, had to start someplace, where would you start with precision farming? The question is, is if you had to start, if you're not in it now, if you had to start, I'd say what would be the first technology you would, you would encourage somebody to get into? Yield monitor. Y'all could just raise your hand if y'all are going to say yield monitor. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then what's the second? Because I think we've pretty much established these folks really believe in yield data, and I do too, and I know Joe, and a lot of us work in precision ag, view the, the ability of using yield data to help us. So what would be the second, Buck? You've tried a bunch. Yeah, the, the swath control on those sprayers saves a lot of chemicals. Uh, but it'd be a toss up between that and the uh, row clutches on the planters. If you got a big planter, if you got a four row planter, it probably ain't gonna save you a whole lot. But if you run the 12, 16 row planter, it makes a big difference. One thing I had done on our sprayer is it was actually a five boom section and I made it into nine just to allow the technology to work that much more for me. So when you can start fine tuning those sections more, you're gonna save more. So therefore, when you go to the planter and you can start uh, controlling each individual row over a section, it's, it's really gonna really pay you back quicker. I would say swath control would be my second and third would be auto steer. Um, I guess they're coming with not swath control, but individual nozzle control or it's here, but I'm not sure the economics of that one. I um, think what we've seen in our state 
is swath control on sprayers was, was readily adopted. We're saving a little bit on chemical, but where we save more is we do, a, we do a lot of road time in the state of Tennessee. We go up and down the road going from different field to field to farm to farm. And, and so they can, that tank lasts longer. You know, you're talking eight, 10% longer. So you can spray more acres on a tank before you have to fill up. And so that's where our folks have said that that's been the biggest advantage to them. They become more fishing at spraying. And we know y'all have Roundup resistant weeds up here yet? <laughs> I think our weed scientists get in a meeting and they trade seed. <clears throat> uh, we're, we're struggling with that, you know, and if you catch it early enough, we can, we can handle it. But the problem is, is our folks are we're traveling over thousands of acres now and we can't get it sprayed quick enough. So anytime we can stay in the field spraying more then um, without filling up, we can increase our efficiency. As far as row cutoffs, the work that we've done in, in Tennessee, it depends on the number of acres in the crop. Uh, corn and cotton are our two biggest. The, the payback is, is probably if you got 1,000 acres, you probably should have had it on it. If you got 2,000, you're probably losing money. With beans, bean costs are, are a little bit cheaper, and so it takes longer for them to pay off. If, if you're using it for the same planter for beans and corn, th then the payback is there if you've got enough acres. I just wanted to add, I think the auto steer on the sprayer with a swath control, I think they're, they're a double must because you might cut your sections off on the ends or in a corner, but if you're not overlapping correctly, if you're overlapping a couple of feet, you're going to lose out on what you're gaining on the ends. Yes, sir. Variable rate irrigation. Variable rate irrigation is a question. Anybody tried it up here? Is James Adkins still here? <laughs> um, no, we haven't tried it. We've got a bunch of pivots, but we haven't haven't tried it. And I don't know what my take on is. It's not really a viable, cost-effective management tool right now. Would be my thought. But I just put in a system, but it's not operational yet. Uh, it's there, the nozzles are there, the switches are there, but the nothing has been done to, for the software and hooking it all up. So I was hoping to have some information this year from it, but I'm not getting anything. Uh, but we've got a lot of variable uh, soil types on our farm. It goes from sand to real heavy clay. So I think in my situation it'll pay. If you've got a whole field of lighter soil, it probably is not going to pay very well. Uh, but I, I think it'll pay for me in my situation. Buck, what are you going to use to make your management zones to do verbal rate irrigation? Uh, <laughs> is that the question? Type, a, I'd type really type like type. to know because I'd like to know what that well, answer what, is. What we did was we took a, a gator with a GPS unit. We rode around the hills where I thought I needed more water. And in the bottoms, they're going to uh, uh, pulsate the nozzles. And on the hills, they'll be on full blast. And I don't know how it's going to work right at this point, because we were lucky just to get it back together and get it running normally. Um, so it'll be interesting next year to see if it does work uh, the way I want it to work. I'll ask the question from the crowd. Is anybody here using verbal rate irrigation? The question is, 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 have you run a Varus machine across your land, basically looking for soil electrical conductivity or some type of machine that gives us electrical conductivity? We, uh, we had worked with Willards, actually the fellow that invented the machine, came out and did a field of ours. It's interesting the data that comes out of it, but it's almost data overload as far as I'm concerned. They printed, printed me off a lot of maps, and I know Willards themselves are working with Cornell University to try to help interpret it to put it to good useful data because there is a lot of information that comes out of it. But I did find some couple low pH spots in the field that I was very surprised to see. Um, I'm in a situation where I just, just ran the various machine across the field in the spring. I don't have any data yet or any maps yet back. Do you remember what kind of ranges you were getting? Buck, you said you went from sand to heavy clay, so you probably have a pretty wide EC range. I can't. can't. I don't, I'm not sure. But I haven't seen those maps. They haven't got anything yeah. done yet. Uh, I can comment on that. We had found a spot in the field that was in the corner that I was uh, four six on the pH, and the majority of the field was five to five five, and some of it being higher. and And the uh, Varus machine found just more variances in the soil than I really thought there was. Even and I tried to correlate soil type to it, and even that 
that didn't line up. So I was really surprised by what I saw. Any, anybody in the crowd using Soul EC to make a management zone? What he was talking about is, is how many of y'all actually download internet from the NRCS data gateway and get a soil map? And, and what are the accuracies of the soil map? And in a sense that when they're mapping, as he said, if there's small acreages, you know, four acres or less, they just lump it into something else. And so it's kind of interesting. We did an intensive, I got a, a big study going in a, about a hundred acre field where I've got variable rate seeding and soybeans and cotton and we pulled a soil map off of the internet they're free download and then i took some of our soil scientists in there and we actually did an intensive soil mapping you know three four days worth of going through and looking and the two maps did not look the same uh, and so there's a lot of lumping in and when you start looking at just using soil maps to make a decision uh, I always tell producers get as much data as you possibly can uh, in order the more layers you have it, It's a tool that can get you but uh, I think but you were talking about driving around I mean, that's what a lot of folks do They'll take a soil map in our area and put it in a handheld or something and then drive out in the field uh, You know, we have a lot of providers here third-party providers and And myself I give a lot of maps out my first question is when somebody hands you a map you need to say, does this map make sense? Because you know your field far better than I. Most of the fields that I do work in, I may have been in it once or twice, but I don't harvest it year after year. So if anybody gives you a map, you need to look at it and say, does this map make sense? And, and hopefully when the maps that you all are given, you look at them and say, yeah, I understand why this area is this, this area is that. Yes, sir. So are, so are you pulling soil samples based off the various map? So you're creating your zones with the various map. Anybody else doing that? We've had a lot of ground covered and, and we don't have a lot of, re, you know, we, we look at our fields and, and you all pulled it. So what's your range? I asked that question a minute ago. What's your range? Well, it's measured in uh, millisecond. I know, but I just give me, is it five to 15 or is it five to 315? Well, I know that, but it also, I mean, everything is relative. You can come back right. two weeks yeah. later and it's just, the magnitude may be a little bit off, but we see a lot of our fields, traditionally silt loam soils, the various runs from five to 20. Yeah. And then, you know, and then we got fields that it runs from five to 255. In a five to 255, I think we can create zones uh, that, are, that are showing you something different. When you get those narrow ranges, we're having difficulty in our state trying to use a real narrow range to make a management zone with it. But y'all got, you know, some more sand, but we got areas that are sand blows to what we call buckshot clay. More questions from the crowd. We got to keep going. Jenny said I had to do this for an hour. Oh, I got a couple more questions. Okay. Perfect. What's the one technology you wish you hadn't bought? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> All right, so right. let me let me rephrase it. What's giving you the most frustration? Let's put it in in that hey, sense. This what, variable rate irrigation right now. Okay. What technology has given you the most frustration? As far as what we're doing is what we've added to our machines. I've done myself. And the most frustrating part is trying to get some support. So much of this is changing and there's updates for, for um, a, a display or trying to find somebody that can help you with the, the, the wiring harnesses that you need for your machine and uh, just getting somebody who's real knowledgeable. That's probably the most frustrating part for us. Yeah, I guess I don't have, don't have any uh, that I like to turn back in that we've used, but um the support is one, and then another one, I don't, I don't think any of the partners are here. Um, teaching the older generation how to deal with it is, is, a, big, is a big issue, and not get too frustrated. <laughs> I can feel your pain. I'm in that older generation. I think the, I need to broaden this word technology to include the various Parts of the industry that you deal with when you're working online, you're working with the banks, you're working with various credit people, you're working with 
an awful lot of people that just come in with, go buy something at the grocery store and they get it on their credit card, that goes into your computer. It's just a mass of different things coming in and <clears throat> every once in a while the banks, they'll change their coding system and then you have to go in and figure out what number that is that was and where did it come from and you trace it back, is it a bank problem or is it something like a Quicken problem, Quicken problem or um, as any other numbers and that's I think what is that part of the technology in making sure that you're operating your operation at a that you're maintaining control over your operation and you know where your money is going and coming in I got two more questions this is a quick one who owns your data Who owns your data? I would like to think we do. That's that's a real concern of mine. Um, that's that's an issue. I know it is, but I just wanted a quick yes or no, or me or somebody else. I can't really add to any comment other than what he had just said. So. <laughs> and it's a big here. it's a big issue. Is who owns the data and how many people are participating in these you know, the big data scene. I, I've got uh, one more question. Uh, you want to say? You have a question? Have a follow -up to that question. Okay. Why, I don't want to be facetious, but why is it important to you to The question is, is why is it important to you as a producer of who owns that data? <laughs> yeah, I would agree. It's how you make your decisions, and it's one of the most important things. Um, uh, when precision planning was bought, um, they come out with a new yield monitor and all that, and I, we had real concerns about you had to sign confidentiality agreement and all this other stuff. And uh, I don't know. It just makes you wonder who they think owns the data sometimes too. So. I think that's the answer to that question is we, if you have to go to um, uh, IRS and uh, and uh, on um, and you have to support what you've submitted for your income tax purposes, that's when it's going to be an issue if you're going to have to say who, who where did your data come from and what faith did you have in that data that you put in that when you recorded that on your income tax. So it eventually, it's, it's your problem as to whether the data. How many of y'all download data off the internet? Raise your hand. How many of y'all put a little check in that box that says, I agree to the, <laughs> how many of you all read it before you put the check in that little box? I, I would advise you if you start using some of these services, you might want to read those agreements. My last question. And, and all of us that, that work in extension, and there's numerous here, is what can we in extension do to help you and your operations in the area of precision ag? If we were to develop programs, or if you need a program, or, or, or a conference that's similar to this, what can we in extension do to help you be more profitable? Yeah, you know, I guess the only thing I can say is just keeping up with the technology. So you've got a partner there, I guess, to help um, help you out when as as these change, as someone to ask a question to. I've got a lot of technology, uh, which I don't have the skills to use. I mean, I, mean, I got uh, computers and monitors that can do uh, oodles of things, but I do the basics. What I need to do. And and I and I it should be up to the like the ag leaders and the Green Star to provide seminars to go over these monitors once in a while. But um, and like my software, they have pro, uh, classes, but they're usually in Columbus, Ohio, or Atlanta, Georgia, or someplace. It'd be nice to have uh, some kind of educational thing for our software and our monitors that we. Have available. 
I can't think of any better program than I've attended in the last few years than this one today. This has been an excellent, and there needs to be more of these. It's, I know for many, many years, I, was, I worked with, at the state level, with when, in one field that we're in, and I worked for about so many years that I just gave up on I just had to say, somebody else has got to take it over. <laughs> And that's when it became a problem. So it's, there needs to be more programs like this. I think Jenny and her crowd did a great job and I think we all deserve, she deserves a round of applause. And she, I will turn the pro, first off I wanna thank all of you all. I know I put you on the spot several times. But y'all put me on the spot about every time I get up and speak, so we're even. <laughs> well, I want to say uh, thank you to the Farmer Panel. Nothing harder than um, getting up and talking in front of a group. But thank you all very much. And I think it's important that we know what the realities are. We can you know, bring researchers in and other people in. But when, the, when your foot hits the ground, that's the reality. So thank you, gentlemen, very much. Um, a whole other seminar. We talked a lot about big data. Farm Bureau is talking about that. It's, it's everywhere in all the media. You know, where's all this data going? You know, what's USDA going to do? It? What happens when it goes to the cloud? So we do have an ag lawyer on staff at the University uh, of Maryland, and Paul Goringer, and he's been around. And so we're going to be working on that. That's our next. Um, ag gag laws, uh, something I wanted to look into, and, and this next thing about big data. So we'll be having something on that. Thanks again to the Farmer Panel. I forgot to thank um, Queenstown Fire Department, uh, volunteered to come out and hang around today just in case we needed anything. And again, I wanna say thank you to all the ag vendors. We couldn't have done that. This is a, it's not only me, it's this whole community that does it. My staff that works with me at the Extension Office, all the ag agents on the shore, Josh and his staff and all the gentlemen that traveled halfway across the country, the, the um, water research, all their staff here. So. It was certainly a joint effort. Don't forget, there's some rain gauges, I think, left, so pick up some rain gauges on the way back, uh, way out, put one on every farm. Don't forget, in the next couple days, you'll be getting a survey from me. So please fill that survey out. If you have any other comments or questions, please call me or email me. We want to try to keep doing this every year. We may rotate. Maybe next year it may be in Delaware. So we're gonna, we're gonna work on that, but any feedback? Uh, will be appreciated and I thank you I couldn't do my job without you just like Josh said and I appreciate all the support and everything that you do for me so thanks and have a great harvest have a great fall